Uh, this uh, video is related to the second lecture, which is uh, Channel Modeling, Trends and Applications. Uh, basically, in uh, this particular course, like other courses that I teach in wireless, uh, I'm trying to put some emphasis on uh, systems engineering. And what is the difference between system engineering and like a regular course, I mean traditional course? In system engineering, the material that you're trying to learn, you're trying to relate that to something which really is going on right now outside. So it's like the emphasis is not in learning skills which are uh, uh, specific. The emphasis is on application of the skills in development of the industry. But still, you need to have some certain skills. And those skills are going to come in. So it's a, a combination of skills, specific skills, learning how to simulate a channel, for example, and knowing that this type of simulation is used where in the industry to solve what type of problem. This is what I think is system engineering. If you want to compare it with a regular course like that we teach, for example, like my example always is digital communication. In digital communication, we don't have any applications. We don't have much of emphasis about like things which are related to applications. So we have very fundamental mathematics behind digital communication. But in here, I'm trying to grab the, uh, the juice of those type of things, which is mathematics that will be applied, and tell you how these things are applied in different standards, really, or in different developments of products or uh, the current trends in there. So that would be the basic difference, really. So as a result, I mean, the same material that I teach in terms of uh, problem solving I can teach them in like maybe one hour. I stretch it to like two hours or three hours. And that stretch is really that uh, infrastructure of system engineering around it. To just tell you that this thing has been applied. And that is the more important part of the course, to my opinion. OK. So with that, I will start to talk about uh, channel modeling in general. Channel modeling as it comes, I mean the word channel modeling, comes across as a very abstract scientific like topic. But you can look at channel modeling in that angle if you look from the angle of radio propagation in terms of solving Maxwell's equations for different boundaries, etc. That's not what we talk about in here. In here, I'm talking about a different type of channel modeling. Channel modeling that is used by the standards for specific purposes. Okay, This is what we want to talk about. So what I'm talking about is, uh, first I talk about why channel modeling, which I told you a little bit of that already. I add a little bit more on that. Then I talk about uh, channel modeling in the standards which standard activities are using channel models and why they are so keen on channel models. It's actually a very, very hot topic in a sense uh, right now in standardization activities. Then uh, after I finish that, I, that's like motivation. So first part, why channel modeling and uh, modeling and standard, that's the motivation. Then after that, I start to talk about multipath which is the cause of all the problems, or is the essence of, in fact, uh, understanding of how multipath works is understanding of the radio channel. And that is understanding of wireless networks, really, at the physical layer, what is happening in that. Then we talk about like what are those mechanisms which are causing multipath. Then I talk about effects of multipath in time and frequency response and the signal in the space. This space is a very new thing. Traditionally, radio channel was time and frequency. But much more recently, people are trying to characterize the radio channel in the space to take advantage of that in the so-called space-time coding. Okay, and that space-time coding is like the new technology 
for possibly the fourth generation cellular networks. So that's a new element, very new element. Then uh, we talk about modeling techniques, that how people do modeling, what are variety of approaches for doing modeling. These material, they don't have any equations. It's just motivation and overview. Just to give you some maturity about what is going on in channel modeling and why it is important. So why channel modeling? Basically, if you want to put it in two like sub-bullets, uh, number one is people need the channel models for effective deployment of wireless networks. For effective deployment of wireless networks, I put an access point or I put a base station. I want to know what is the receive signal strength at different distances. If it's a voice-oriented network, I want to know this receive signal strength to know the coverage of the cell phone, for example. If it is like a wireless LAN, actually it becomes more important because the data rate changes with receive signal strength. So I want to know the throughput of my system as well. So as a result, it is a little bit more important. Now, so uh, basically I use like uh, receive signal strength modeling for calculation of the coverage coverage for voice oriented networks means that how far my cell phone works coverage for like wireless lands or mobile data networks means what is my data rate at a given location because that's a function of it then in addition to that I use this modeling of the receive signal strength for interference analysis then interference again has two different uh, different usage for cellular networks in the uh, in the uh, in the license bands if you remember I told you the systems are licensed unlicensed if you want to divide them like all these voice oriented networks like like cellular networks which are wide area networks they are operating in license bands and all these local networks like WLANs or WPANs, they are operating in what? In unlicensed bands. Now, interference for licensed and unlicensed bands is different. Okay, the way that we want to analyze that. In the licensed bands, I want to analyze the interference because I want to know that how should I plan my cells. So I have a bunch of cells. What should be the size of cells? How far they have to stay around? They interfere with one another. How much is the interference between them? When I come to unlicensed bands, I'm using interference really for interference analysis. Means that uh, I have a Bluetooth, I have 802.11. B, A, uh, B, B and G, for example. Both of them are operating in what? 2.4 gigahertz using the same frequency bands. How do they interfere with one another? How destructive they are with respect to one another? So this is not for network planning, really. This is real interference, but is unintentional interference. In military, in fact, applications, interference analysis is also used for intentional interference. But that's not a subject that we cover in this course. It's not related to us. Now, the second issue that is important, and I mean, the second thing that we want to solve. So the first thing is, by channel modeling, I want to know that what is the receive signal strength, to know my throughput of the data network, and also to know how people interfere to plan my network. Okay. The second issue that uh, motivates me to study channel modeling is design of the modems and the medium access control. So physical layer and MAC layer. Basically, if I want to go to different physical layers and MAC, I always have alternatives. For physical layer, for example, if I want to go to broadband, I can go to equalization or I can go to OFTM. Which one should be my choice? If I don't understand the channel, wideband characteristics, I cannot do that. Okay? So, basically people are coming with these alternatives for physical layers. 
Okay, and then I have to compare and see which one is more suitable for 802.11, for example. In order to do that, I need to have a channel model for the, for the characteristics and behavior of the channel so that I can compare them. Okay, so basically models which are used for this type of applications are more comprehensive. We call them like broadband channel models. They're more details. And that's the one that most people are working on today in like 8.11 or 8.15 or something like that. Anyways, when I develop these more comprehensive models, I use these more comprehensive models really to understand the details of time, frequency, and space characteristics of the propagation. When I'm doing receive signal strength, I'm only interested in receive signal strength. The first one for receive signal strength, sometimes I refer to that as narrow band signal characteristics. For the second one, I call it wide band. May not be the best. But anyways, if I have this like comprehensive models, if you want to call them, which has the time and space and frequency characteristics included in them, then what I can do is that you come up to me and you say, this is my modem technology. I can tell you these are the data rate limitations over that particular channel. Because in different channels, modems behave differently. Okay? And then in addition to that, I use channel models for MAC layers. Alternative. If I have TDMA versus CDMA, for example, or if I have CDMA and I have broadband CDMA versus narrowband CDMA, or I have broadband CDMA with multi-carrier, or I have a space-time coding with that. I mean, all of these ORs are millions of these ORs. How do you want to compare them? I mean, if I sit down in the standardization activity and I want to decide if I don't have any model for the channel, each manufacturer comes with a solution and I cannot reject anything or accept anything. Okay? So that's why, that's the core of standardization activities is to come up with an acceptable channel model so that if people are coming with different solutions, you can just justify which is which. Okay? Those are the ones that you can use for medium access control analysis, and you can use it for what? Calculation of data rate limitation. Because generally, two important issues are these two issues. Data rate limitations for data applications. Whenever you have data applications, people want to increase the data rate. We talked about that in the last lecture. And so, but how far you can go with a given modem design technology? And then for throughput, delay characteristics, again related to the data applications, but also you can talk about throughput in the context of capacity of a network in a multi-user environment. Okay? So basically I need to quantify these things, like data rate limitations and uh, like capacity and throughput, but if I want to quantify that, I have to do it on a real channel model which fits with the reality. Now how about rather than that I go and test well if you want to test you cannot repeat it. Number two it's very expensive. So as a result any standardization organization comes up to some channel models to make the life easy because now you can compare apples with apples if people are coming with different solutions. Okay, and uh, for us, if we want to consider ourselves researchers, understanding of the channel actually by itself is a research topic. It's a very good, rich research topic. Because in the academia, we want to create the environment for the industry to do their things properly. Okay, so a lot of like research material that the students are doing somehow are entangled with channel modeling or measurements. A good part of that. 
Now, with that, I think the second question comes that, what are the examples? Who is doing what? These are some examples. We will, uh, these are the channel models that, throughout this course, we will talk about them gradually. Uh, like, for example, GSM, the standards, they have like a multipath channel model, which characterizes the multipath in different regions in urban areas, suburban areas, high-rise, low-rise buildings. So why did they come up with this channel model? GSM was supposed to be a system because they had to choose between different alternatives for the different solutions that different companies come, come up with. Okay. Then other channel models, one is like uh, Akamura Hata that later on it's uh, like augmented with cost 31 model. These are coverage models. This is another example. Cost 31 is a standardization activity. Okay? And then they come up with models. This time, these models that they have developed works for both cellular pans, which are 800 to 900 megahertz, and PCS pans, which are around 1.8, 1.9 gigahertz. These models are for receive signal strength. These models are the more comprehensive one. How much more comprehensive? These guys are talking about like multipath in a little bit more details. Okay. Means that they have the multipath in general, but they don't have the space element in the multipath. Okay. We will see these things a little bit more later on. Then there is another model, JTC model. JTC model covers I mean, provides models for multipath and coverage, both of them, and for the PCS bands, in particular 1.9 gigahertz. So this is another model. JTC was a joint technical committee which was formed in the United States by the industrial alliances to come up with a model for the propagation in the so-called PCS bands. If you remember, PCS bands were the bands which were sold in the States for $20 billion dollars around 1997. So they were very, very important. Immediately after that, uh, American National Institute of Standard formed the JTC to form channel models for them. Okay, and this is the result of that, and we will see part of that also in this class. Then, ADO 2.11 has channel models. For the coverage, these are the old channel models. But more recently, in ADO 2.11, they want to go to MIMO technology, multiple input, multiple output. And for the MIMO technology in indoor areas, you need channel models, and channel models are now very complex, more comprehensive. The one that we have in G, uh, uh, GSM is time. This is a space time. It's very recent, and it's, even right now, I think, is still active. It's not finalized. Then. We have ADO 2.15. If you remember, ADO 2.15 is the standardization activity which did the Bluetooth, and now they are working on ultra-wideband. The group which is on ultra-wideband is working on channel models. They are very active on channel models. Now, the frequency of operation for ADO 2.15 is 3.4 to 10.6 gigahertz. I think we discussed that in the last lecture. See, when I go from one channel, for example, for ADO 2.15, why not I'm not using ADO 2.11? Because ADO 2.11 has different goal. Number one goal in ADO 2.11 for today's, in fact, activities is go over a space-time coding. People are not using a space-time coding that as in that context in ADO 2.15. Okay. Number two is that the frequency operation is different. These are ultra-wideband means that the bandwidth of a channel is like 500 megahertz or 2 gigahertz. Okay? But ADO 2.11, the bandwidth is around like 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz. Okay? Now, the bandwidths are different and frequency of operation are different, so characteristics of the channel is different. Then the other issue is that issue of the setting. I mean, the model that I developed for indoor doesn't work for the outdoor. So as a result, I have models for indoor, for outdoor, and in outdoor I have different areas. 
suburban areas like high rise low rise inside the city so I have plenty of models around me for different applications because different applications are using different center frequencies and bandwidths and also different setting because I use them in different areas and understanding of these things is actually foundation for next generation because if you want to make any improvement you need to know the channel to exploit the channel to go for the next one because otherwise it's only fantasy so any work which is not including the channel modeling often is not going to get anywhere so that's why that everybody brings that another impact input so up to here I told you about differences in the applications and frequencies then there is another issue which is uh, all of these applications were related to uh, telecommunication in telecommunication I'm interested in what I'm interested in data rate and I'm interested in coverage but if you remember in the last lecture I told you the future of wireless network is toward what location aware broadband ad hoc networks if you want to call it huh? that lo location aware type of applications need modeling for location awareness and location awareness they use different matrices the most popular one is like time of arrival for accurate positioning or receive signal strength but receive signal strength I have modeled it for other people for coverage I have no problem for time of arrival however there is no model available in the literature and now all these time of arrival systems are coming in and people want to examine it as an example SOSAS project in DARPA spend, was spending like about a million dollar per day of research and development during 1997 and their objective was to design indoor geolocation systems with one meter accuracy but that was one of the object I mean they have a lot of objectives for the indoor that was the objective one meter accuracy and at the end they had to drop the requirement because they did not know the, the difficulties which are involved in positioning when you come in the indoor areas so it's a very very new and recent area of research which is now emerging and actually both at uh, WPI and at the University of Oulu we have very good programs around that and we address some of that in here. very good research leading research programs in there now so that was the introduction and as uh, if you want to summarize my introduction we need these channel models that we are going to describe and understand about them for variety of standardization activities and these standardization activities are trying to use these models to find the coverage analyze the interference and select between different MAC layers and physical layers in addition to that they want to use these channel models to find the accuracy of positioning systems which are the next generation wireless network okay now let's go and see what is wrong what is what is difficult now about it why radio channel modeling is difficult I mean if I have like a cable or I mean we have other important mediums for telecom fiber was very important in the past like few years now it's cooling down a little bit but for the fiber why channel modeling is not as important as radio or we had cable used for so many years and it still is used for data communication we have twisted pair for telephone but channel modeling was not that important for the wire things but how come for wireless is important the reason is that if you have a wire wire basically is a conductor waveguide takes the signal from one point takes it to another point but since it's like uh, an RLC network so it's like a low pass filter so it has like a bandwidth that's the only thing that we have so we know that the bandwidth of like telephone channel is like four kilohertz for example if for the telephone for voice if you want to go to DSL etc it goes around megahertz for example and what characteristics is pretty steady in there almost 
Now, if you go, however, to if you want to challenge the cables or the twisted pairs, you go to frequencies that they have very weak signals in there, then you will have modeling problem. Modeling issues comes. For example, if people want to do like telecommunication over uh, power lines, then channel modeling comes to the picture because they are not designed for that and they behave as strange. But if they have designed a cable for something, that's so. Basically, if I have like a cable, I have direct connection. Two points are connected to one another. I have a waveguide. So I have a single path between transmitter and receiver, and I can calculate everything easily. But when I just cut this wire, the signal starts to spread all over the place, and it doesn't go from one location to another guided. Okay? It propagates all over the place. So what will happen is that rather than coming from one path between transmitter and receiver, it comes through many different paths. These are some examples. For example, in the atmosphere, you have layers called ionosphere and troposcatter. And frequencies up to certain frequencies get bounced from these layers. People in the military actually take advantage of that. So if they want to make communication for like 400 m miles, there is no line of sight communication between transmitter and receiver. They hit the troposcatter and they collect the reflection. Okay, but when they hit the troposcatter and they collect the reflection, in here they have a bunch of bubbles. So they don't get reflected through one path. They get reflected through a bunch of these bubbles. Okay, so I send one signal to the tropo, and at the receiver, I receive it through different paths, which we call it multipath. Okay? And that multipath is the cause of all problems. Actually, it's also, if we are wise and we know how it operates, we can take advantage of that, actually. But if we don't know how it works and how it operates, it's going to ruin our communication. Okay? Now, so this is one example. Tropo scatter, in which I mean multipath is in there. If I come to like, these are like uh, you have seen these uh, microwave dishes that they use it in the telephone network, in, in the TV networks, for example. When you go to the mountains, you cannot communicate with like wire because it's very expensive to put wires there. So people use microwave line of sight. You can go up to several tens of kilometers with that. Okay, so what you do is that you have two dishes just facing each other. And with that, you think that you have single path, but in reality, you don't. Even people have found out that even in those, sometimes you have bounced signals from the ground, and you have some deflected paths. So you have more than one direct line of sight path. Okay, and then I have multipath. Whenever I have multipath, it causes problem. I have to understand, and that's the purpose of the analytical thing we do later on. But this is multipath. This is my source of problem. When I come in the like cellular environment, which is the purpose of this course really, I have this antenna and I have a mobile. My ideal thing is that I send the signal and it comes to the mobile in one path, but in reality it doesn't happen like that. It gets bounced through different buildings and arrives in here, so again I have multipath. If I come to indoor environments, multipath is tremendous, much more than outside, because I have a lot of objects, and often I don't have line of sight between transmitter and receiver. See, in here I had line of sight, in here I didn't have line of sight, but in here I had line of sight, or I, I could imagine scenario. In indoor, most of the time it's not line of sight. And the signal also have a lot of walls, and these walls are like mirrors. They reflect the signal. So I will have very heavy multipath in indoor environments. So no matter what I want to do, my applications are this one, cellular, which is outdoor, and also I have like indoor applications. These are where uh, is my focus. 
indoor for WLANs and WPANs, outdoor for cellular network. In both cases, I have multipath. And this multipath, as these buildings get more dense in outside, they get worse. So if I go downtown areas, which they have, in which they have like this so-called urban canyons, I will have a lot of multipath. And when I come to indoor environments, I have a lot of multipath. But if I go to highway systems, I have less multipath. Okay. But what I want to learn really about Lady Channel is I want to learn about multipath really. And what is the impact on that? Why do I want to learn that? Because now I can generate design next generation. And I can understand the existing generation. So now just to classify the multipath and things which causes multipath, I would like to refer to, to the so-called, I mean in the experimental propagation studies, they are talking about uh, uh, propagation mechanisms. Okay. And this propagation mechanism helps us to understand the sources of multipath or cause of multipath. There are basically like uh, first, uh, first, in fact, propagation mechanism is the so-called transmission. So I have transmitter here, sorry, receiver in here. The signal trans gets transmitted through here, and this is I call it line of sight transmission or the transmission. And in between, I may have a wall. I have to pass through the wall to get to the receiver. This is the first path between the transmitter and receiver. Then I have other paths which are coming through reflection. Because each of these walls inside the building or wherever is like a reflector for the radio propagation. So I have reflected paths. These two are the most common ones. Then in addition to that, when the radio wave hits the corner edges, when it hits the edges, it gets diffracted. So one path hits in here, and many, many paths get diffracted. And one of them comes to the receiver. Okay. And the fourth mechanism in there is the so-called scattering. So scattering is like I have a wall. And the wall appears to me, to my eyes, very flat. But if my wavelengths are very, very small, like if I have like infrared, for example, wavelength is comparable with these bounces on the wall that I don't see them. So when I go to those frequencies which are very, very high, wavelength of the signal becomes very, very small, and then when it hits something that looks flat to me, it doesn't really hit that. So it gets a scatter. Okay? A scattering basically mostly happens for infrared, for our type of applications. But the three mechanisms which are very important for us are transmission, diffraction, and reflection. These are the three that happens mostly to radio channels. A scattering also happens, I mean, in some of our applications, if you go to the jungles, for example, and the signal, microwave signal, hits like the trees, etc., it gets a scattered. Okay, it's not reflection, it's a scattered. So basically, I know my problem is multipath, and I know there are like four mechanisms which are creating that. One is transmission, one is reflection, one is diffraction, one is scattering. And based on that, I will try to develop some handy models later on or throughout this course for the next like four lectures, actually. So, if in summary, the parameters which are affecting uh, multipath, one of them is frequency of operation, one is environment for the communication, one is type of application which is basically which bandwidth I'm using. Is it narrow band? Is it wide band? Does it have positioning? Or it doesn't have positioning? In addition to that, a speed of movement, if I'm fixed or I'm walking or I'm at the car speed, will have impact on the multipath. 
Because as I'm moving, the multipath structure changes. Okay? So here we are. And then type of antennas. If I use omnidirectional, if I use sectored antenna or MIMO antenna, I will have different models for the behavior of the channel. Okay. So there are a bunch of parameters. And since I have a bunch of parameters affecting that, I will have different channel models for different applications. Now, this is basically talking about different application environments. This is a picture. I talked about these things before. I have like variety of cells. I have mega cells, which are the satellite cells, which co covers like a country. I have like macro cells, which is like I have one antenna in the hive and covers a 30, 30 kilometer distance on the highways. This is called macro cell. Okay. Then I have micro cells, which is inside the inside the like uh, inside the streets in the town. And then I have like pico cells, which are like some areas in the indoor areas. And then I have femo cell, which is even smaller than that, around one person. So. Different environment really by size, if I want to call around me is like femo cell if you want to call it. In the like hundred meter area, we in the indoor in particular we call it like pico cell. And then if I go in the streets like hundreds of meters, I call it micro cells. And then if I go like tens of kilometers, I call it macro cells. Then I go hundreds of, micro, hundreds of kilometers, I call it mega cells. Now, for each of these sizes of cells, behavior of the channel is different. Okay, so sometimes when people want to classify the channel models, they say this is the channel model for pico cell, or this is for micro cell, or this is for femo cell. Then another type of thing is the type of application. If I have it for like voice oriented or data oriented networks, if it is for like center frequency of 2.4 or center frequency of 3.4 or center frequency of 800 megahertz, okay. So I have variety of models which have evolved for different center frequencies and different sizes of cells, okay. So here we here we are. And then these models that they have, some of them are for narrowband application, some of them are for wideband applications, and some of them are for what? Positioning application. Positioning is the much more recent one. It's not much of that in the other books. But I have one chapter in this book, in the next revision of the book. So now, what will happen that models for like indoor and outdoor have to be different. Very simple. If I come in the indoor areas, do you remember I had four type of mechanisms? I had like transmission, reflection, scattering, and diffraction. If I change my area, the dominance changes. When I'm coming indoor areas, Walls are relatively narrow and a lot of them are like wood and sheet rocks and signal goes through them very easily. Okay? So the dominant parameters for propagation indoor environment is transmission and reflection. A scattering exists when signal hits all these corners, but is so weak that it does not dominate. Okay? And then if I have a transmitter and receiver in indoor area, I have tons of paths, as you can see in this figure. So this is line of sight direct and a bunch of reflections, first order, second order, from third order, from different walls. So as a result in indoor areas, I have a specific characteristics dominated by transmission and reflection. And somehow I have to model it differently from what is happening in the outdoor. When I come to the outdoor, however, for example, either I have cases like this, which I have 
line of sight and reflection okay but when the signal wants to pass through the obstacles in here obstacles is not a wall is a building signal doesn't go through the buildings I mean it becomes very very weak so my mechanism is either line of sight or reflection or a third mechanism which we call it diffraction what if I have a transmitter in here in here sorry and a receiver in here that's inside the downtown area there is no line of sight between them because the line of sight which comes in here passes through several buildings and really buildings kill the signal signal cannot go through the building so what will happen is that that little signal which gets diffracted from the corners that's the signal which comes in here okay so for the indoor everything was dominated by what transmission and reflection and besides that the structure of the objects was very different objects are walls signal can't go through the walls when I come to the outdoor mechanisms which hold really is diffraction and line of sight and reflections whenever line of sight is there that's the dominant one it is not there some reflection if it is not there diffraction so these are the two but there is no transmission because signal cannot pass through the building okay now so that was like just to tell you just and like an introduction a little bit more scientific I mean what I at the beginning I told you that you have different models for different areas then I told you that the cause of everything is multipath and then I told you that now multipath is caused by four mechanisms which is transmission reflection scattering and diffraction and then I came to this point and I told you that in different areas these mechanisms combine differently okay so that's why things is happening but still we have nothing quantified okay now for the next step now I want to tell you that what will happen when I have multipath no matter what has caused the multipath what will happen to time and frequency and space characteristics of the signal I think for visualization space is the easiest one Huh? because in a space I think I have it in here I think you can understand what I mean by a space I have an antenna in here I have a signal in here this signal which is coming from here to here comes through different angles to the sky or signal which goes from here to here comes through different angles arrives from different angles because the paths are arriving from different angles so that's easiest to de describe okay but this is the most difficult to implement or the latest one to implement how do you want to detect the signal from different angles if I have an antenna like this it's an omnidirectional antenna which accepts all the signal from all the different places but if I want to have to be selective in a space I need to have an array of antennas multiple antennas and then I change them somehow or combine them somehow so that they will select different space angles like this angle, this angle, this angle so implementation of space diversity they call it is very challenging but the understanding is very easy signal comes through different paths and they are arriving from different angles okay so I can just understand what will happen in a multipath environment, signal is arriving from different spatial angles. So that's and that's the cause. Now, problems we will see it later. Now, what will happen for the signal when I have multipath in time domain? So I told you about the space. What will happen now about the time domain? In time domain, 
What will happen for the signal in multipath is that the paths that are coming have different lengths. The first one is shortest, and then this one is a little bit longer. This is a little longer. This is a little longer. So if I send, for example, a narrow pulse like this, I will receive a bunch of pulses coming one after another. Because the paths that they are going through have different lengths. So if I look into the time domain, means I want to find the impulse response of the channel. I send a very, very narrow pulse. I receive several pulses, one after another. So the pulse gets really spreaded. And that spread, people refer to that as multipath spread. OK. Remember, in this one, we, are, we want just to have like definition, intuition, understanding. Then later on, we develop some maths for this thing. But that intuition is very important. OK. So in a space, I have different angles of arrival. In time, I have different time of arrivals. And it makes sense because the paths which are arriving have different length. OK. So the last but not the least is what will happen to frequency domain. Means that if I take like a cosine, for example, and I changed its frequency from, let's say, 900 megahertz up to 1100 megahertz. What will happen to the amplitude of the received signal? This is what we usually refer to as frequency response. OK? In the first one, this for time response, we have, like in all these signal courses in electrical engineering, we have impulse response. We send a narrow impulse, and we see what we get at the output or at the receiver. In here, we send, we change the frequency of a cosine from certain frequency to another one, and we look at the received one. If you do that experimentally, actually, this is result of experimental measurement of frequency response in an indoor area, you see something like this up and down. So in different frequencies, you have different notches. And you have places that are signal is very weak, places that signal is strong. This low thing is referred to as fading. OK. Now, why this thing has happened? Because frequency response is Fourier transform of time response. If this is the time response of the channel, if I just calculate the Fourier transform of that, it's not going to be flat. It's going to be something like this. And actually, this particular set, they have measured the frequency response. An inverse Fourier transform of that has been this thing. So in another word, when I'm looking into the time, the important thing is that I send a pulse. I receive many different pulses. How do you want to model that? In a space, I send a signal, arise from different angles. How do you want to model that? When I come to frequency response, at different frequencies, I have different amplitudes, OK, or different gains. How do you want to model that? OK? These are the so-called wideband characteristics, time, space, and frequency in the wideband. OK? Means that I have a very narrow pulse. Narrow pulse has very wide band. OK? In here, I have a very wide band, in fact, a spectrum that I'm covering. But is, are these all the problems? No. No, that's not all the problem. Even if you send like a narrow pulse, just one of these frequencies. Let's take one of these frequencies, this frequency, or this frequency. The signal that you receive is not fixed. OK? As soon as I start to move, this signal starts to fluctuate. Why it fluctuates? This time, I have only one frequency. I'm sending from transmitter to receiver. OK? And I'm just taking the. If I keep everything steady, I have a fixed power. But as soon as I start to move, Multipath changes. 
Okay? So I have different paths now. So power starts to fluctuate. It's very similar to this. In here, when I'm changing the frequency, different paths get added together to each other differently. Equivalently, if I start to move, different paths change actually. And they get added differently. So power starts to fluctuate. So this is in time, okay? But this time is not one second, two second, three second. This is like I send a pulse, I receive the pulse very wide band, several pulses. This is called wide band characteristics. Now, if I have narrow band characteristic, I send only a cosine, not a narrow pulse, and I see what is the receive power. This is one example of that. Receive power also fluctuates ups and downs. Very similar to fluctuations in frequency like this. And both of them, they cause these deep notches, like here, like here, which we refer to them as fading. Means that your signal dies, fades, fades away. Okay? So, this is just very quantitative, uh, very non-quantitative, just to give you an idea how complex it is. Okay? So if I have only a cosine and I'm sending, cosine changes like this. The receive signal changes like this as I'm moving. Okay? This is change with respect to time. But if I fix the time, okay, fix the entire environment, nobody moves, and I send a narrow pulse, I receive something like this in the time domain, I receive something like this in frequency domain. Okay, these are a lot of fluctuations in the receive power, a lot of fluctuations in the receive power. Those lots of fluctuations in receive power is referred to as fading. And what we want to do, we want to model this fading. Why do we want to do that? Because then we can, we can take advantage and design next generation of the system. This is like one, impulse response of the channel with angle of arrivals. These are impulse response at different angles. Okay, this is a spatial angles, like this one, angle of arrival. See, angle of arrival in here are different. This is like zero, this is something, this is another, this is another. Okay, so channel impulse response is different in each of them. These are those different channel impulse responses at different phases at different angles of arrival. Okay. How do we want to model that? We will talk about that later. The last but not the least issue in here is that I'm also interested, so I'm interested in modeling the fluctuation of the power. I'm interested in modeling of impulse response and frequency response. I'm interested in modeling of angle of arrival. On top of all of them, I'm also interested in time of arrival of first or direct path. That is the one which is used in geolocation. When I send like a path, a narrow pulse, I want to know when it arrives at the receiver because based on the difference of this time, I can tell you that how much is the distance. Okay. So I need to model that time of arrival because sometimes when I send the first path, I receive the first path at the receiver, and sometimes when I send the first path, first path gets buried on the other path, and I make errors in there. So the distance is 10 meters, and I read it 100 meters because first path was killed. How do you want to model that? That's the latest Modeling involved in positioning. Okay? To just provide accurate positioning in there. So these are what we want to model in general. Now, how much of that in this course? I don't know. Now, then this. So basically, I want to model angle of arrival plus fluctuations of power plus time response and frequency response and space response. These are what I want to do. Okay? Now, what are my modeling techniques? One modeling technique is like deterministic. 
means that I take the Maxwell's equations, finite difference time domain is a very well-known technique that is used for numerically solving Maxwell's equations. So you have a house, home, whatever, plan, and then you run the Maxwell's equations with the boundary conditions which are the walls, and you solve it. But the problem with that is that for solving this, this is a numerical method. To solve it, you have to create like a grid inside the building. Size of grid should be in the order of uh, uh, wavelength. Wavelength at one gigahertz is like 30 centimeters. So I want like city of Boston and a grid which is like 30 centimeters. You cannot do that. Because this is like, at that grid, I want to solve differential equations huh? constantly in all of them. So it's very huge. So finite difference time domain is used for like very, very small areas. Like if you have like a microwave waveguide or a small equipment, you can use it. If you want to go with larger areas, you have to compromise, get some approximation, come to lower frequencies. And if it gets too huge, well, you cannot do it. The other technique, approximation to Maxwell's equations, is the so-called ray tracing. Because before Maxwell's equation, how they were solving the optics problems. Optics is propagation, like radio propagation. They were using like ray optics method. You can use the same ray optics the way that I was showing you earlier. Those def definitions for diffraction, reflections, etc. those are ray optics, really. Those are fundamental of ray optics. To avoid Maxwell equations, you just find all the reflections, transmissions, etc. Like, like here. Okay? And you can solve this. But that's, again, inside an indoor area. If I go outdoor, the map of the building, map of, map of the other, is very expensive to create. And then... These mechanisms that I told you, four mechanisms, calculations for transmission and reflection is very easy. But when you go to diffraction, it's very hand-picked. I mean, you have to just know that very because there are zillions of opportunities. You cannot automate it. You can automate transmission. You can automate reflection. But diffraction, automation is very difficult if you go to 3D. So the ray tracings that are commercial are either transmission reflection, no diffraction, okay, or they have like approximations for diffractions. So they are not very successful, but they are helpful somehow here, there for a specific application. So this is about what deterministic approaches. Ray tracing is used in a lot of like indoor areas. And it still is the most accurate method for receive signal strength for the indoor areas. Very useful. But uh, for the Maxwell's equations, uh, not much. The most popular method for modeling for the indoor or outdoor for wireless application is measurement-based statistical modeling. Measurement-based statistical modeling basically means that you go and collect a lot of measurements and then develop a statistical model for that. And that's the one that we study more than anywhere else. Now, there are two techniques when you want to do the modeling. Well, there are several approaches. One is narrowband, wideband, and space-time. You can add to that also, I mean, geolocation, for example. For each of them, you have to do different measurements now. I mean, if you could solve Maxwell's equation, there's one forever. Ray tracing is one forever. It gives you time, frequency, everything together. A space time, all of them are in ray tracing. But when you come to like measurements, they are different because the equipment which are used are different for measurements. So measurements are either narrow band, wide band, a space time for positioning, different measurements, and they could be done in time domain or they could be done in frequency domain, so a variety of them. And that's the main topic that we study in the rest of my lectures on the channel modeling. 
So I tell you, this is what they have measured for this particular like standards, and this is the model they have developed. Now you go and apply that to a particular application for your project to see that this space station or this wireless LAN covers what and what happens to that. Okay, that's what we want. We want main core that we study. So modeling, basically, the modeling concept is like that. I have some simulations like ray tracing. I have done some measurements of the channel. I put all of them together. I create a database. And then I use that database with some assumption and analysis to develop a model. OK? It's a very practical model. And this model must be useful for some engineers, because we are system engineers. So we only talk about the ones which are useful. OK? Now, some of those uses, for example, for ray tracing model, if I use it, I can develop something like this. This is a deployment tool. Actually, this software was developed in our laboratories around 1992, three, something like that. And uh, what it does is that you put the location of your access point inside. This is the first floor of Atwater Kent Laboratory. And then what you do is that you run the ray tracing for all of the locations in here, and you will find the coverage. Or you put it in here, you will find the coverage. OK? This is one application of like modeling, path loss modeling. Path loss modeling is the same as modeling of received signal strength. OK, I use it for what? Coverage studies. So now you can know that where to put your access points, for example. Another one is that if I come and I model time of arrival, do you remember I told you when I know the time of arrival, then in some places, well, sorry, if I'm interested in time of arrival, I send a pause, and I want to receive this pause and say how much time it took. But the problem is that sometimes I don't receive that signal. It's very weak. I receive from multipath. So rather than measuring the direct path, I'm measuring the reflected path. So I'm making a lot of error in the distance. Okay. So if I develop models for that, for example, I can use it and I come to the building. That's the same building, the first floor of Atwater Camp. And I divide the area into like undetected direct path, this blue part. These are the parts. I have used ray tracing for that in the ear. Okay, with the ray tracing, what we have shown is that in these dark blue areas, the first path is hidden and you're picking up something else. Okay, in the red ones, the first path is very strong and solid, stronger than everybody. In the green side, first path is weaker than other paths, but still it's detectable. So what is the significance of that? If you want to design a positioning system for here, you know that if you put the system, I mean the, the transmitter in here, the receiver in these places is like really giving you trash. In these areas, you have to be careful. In these areas, you're good. OK? So that's one application if I have a model. We haven't talked about the model. This is application of the model. Now, another thing that I can do with the models, I can run real-time channel simulators. So you'd give me measurements, statistical models, ray tracing, whatever, prototype mode uh, and ray tracing. Then I take these measurements, statistical models, ray tracing, and then I have a piece of hardware which is going to simulate that channel. So then. What you do is that you design a prototype modem, transmitter and receiver. You connect it with this box. And then you can even simulate the interference. So now you sit down inside your lab, and you analyze the performance of a modem versus another one. What is the good about this thing? Because this is repeatable environment. OK? I mean, I can do the same model for different modems. Number two is that it's not expensive. I don't need to go outside and drive in the streets for hours. I sit in the lab, I do my stuff. Okay. One example of that is this PropSim, which is designed in Electrobit in Olu. And uh, this is one, one example, transmitter and receiver, which are connected to this box. And this is the computer, which is controlling the channels for this model. 
So this is the box. This is transmitter receiver. This is a computer control. In the computer control, I can pick up different channel models. You give me measurements, I map the measurements. Ray tracing, map the ray tracing. Or you have 802.11 model or 802.15 model, everything. Okay? So I have different models in software it's stored in the computer. It maps to this hardware, and the hardware actually simulates a scenario outside. And then my modem is in here. I take this modem, I put another modem, I compare them. And I see which one is better than the other one. Okay? Now, these boxes are very expensive. This particular box, we paid like $240,000 for that. Okay? And now, uh, to add more features, and the bandwidth of this one is 70 megahertz. If you want to go for like ultra wideband, it's not useful. Okay? So, but if we have something like that, that's fantastic. Uh, these are some like channel impulse responses which are simulated in this type of software. So this is what you simulate rather than, for example, this actual channel impulse response or these actual channel impulse responses or this actual channel impulse responses. This is the actual channel impulse response. What you simulate in the hardware is something like right, here. Okay, this is a variety of paths. And these paths are moving up and down, but they get mapped on this piece of hardware, and you have the modems across them. Okay. Now, uh, in, when we want to start to now model the things, so I, can, I don't go over like Maxwell's equations, not even ray tracing that much. So we are talking about a statistical modeling. For a statistical modeling now, I have this like jumbo mumbo. I mean, everything is moving around, and I want to model it. First thing that I have to I have I have to do I have to define some parameters, which I can measure and I can model, and also they are useful. Okay. So, th that's the whole art of a statistical modeling. So, define something that somebody can use one parameter, and tell me how you will measure it, and then how you develop a simple model for that. Now, classically, people look at three parameters for modeling of the characteristics of a channel. One is for distance-power relationship. They try to find a parameter which helps you to find the coverage. Another parameter they want to know how much your multipath get spread out. Means that you send one pulse, you receive many, many pulses, how much it spreads in time. That's the second parameter. And the third parameter is that they call it Doppler spread. That's the rate of variation of your channel. You send a very narrow pulse, uh, sorry, narrow, uh, you send one single frequency, and you receive the signal the amplitude changes, goes up and down. Okay, you take the Fourier transform of those variations. Fourier transform variation of the channel is called Doppler spread. We come back to these parameters later on in more details. Here is just to tell you that there are three parameters which are our focal point. One is a parameter that relates the distance to the power that I use it for interference and coverage. The other one is multipath spread that I use it for data rate limitations. And then there is Doppler spread that I Doppler spectrum, which I use it to quantify variations of the channel, how fast channel is changing. Okay, these are three parameters which are my focal point. Now we have to see how to measure them, how to model them, what are the models, which standards are recommending for that. These are what we do in the next three lectures or something. More recently, people are interested in angle of arrival and time of arrival for positioning. Time of arrival of first path. So, on top of three classical parameters, I have two more parameters or two more uh, characteristic parameters. Angle of arrival and time of arrival of the first path. 
And these are more or less the main theme of all channel modeling efforts in any standard activities today and for any wireless networks. And this would be my last part of uh, this section of uh, or lecture two. Any questions? If you don't have any questions, we take again another uh, pause and we come back for uh, one more uh, segment of the course, which is uh, introductory part for lecture uh, three.